Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, I'm Sean, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. If you're a parent, you might have made this statement or you would have heard it from your parent. And the statement goes like this. It says, if you work harder, you will be successful. And that advice, as well-meaning as it is, is entirely off the mark. If anything, Hard work just gets you digging a deeper hole. And not only is hard work wrong advice, but it fails to acknowledge the power of luck. No parent ever turns to a kid and says, wait for luck, then pounce. Is hard work as wrong as we're making it out to be? If you're shaking your head a bit in disagreement, it's because we've heard that hard work mantra too many times. And we've all worked hard, but it hasn't necessarily got us the rewards that we've all expected. If hard work isn't the answer, what is? Let's find out in today's episode. Now, this is going to be a little longer episode, so we're going to split it up into two parts. But we'll cover three or four things anyway. And we're going to look at hard work versus skill. Hard work versus luck. And hard work versus what's needed. Let's start out with the first one, which is hard work versus skill. How many dosas do you have to make to get really good at it? If you look up the word dosa, that's D-O-S-A, you'll find that it's a type of pancake or crepe. It looks like that, and it's made from rice flour and ground pulses. It's typically served with spiced vegetable fillings, and it's delicious to eat. Now, if you watch a YouTube video, the process of making a dosa seems relatively straightforward. You pour out the batter on a hot pan, and then, with a circular motion, much like a crepe, you make the dosa. Over the past three years, I've made approximately 2,700 dosas. That's because when we come back from the walk, I set about making breakfast, and for breakfast we have dosas. And 900 days later, three dosas every day, you have 2,700 dosas. Now, you'd have thought that I would have learned how to make the perfect dosa, but that's not the case at all. Almost everyone else seems to turn out a dosa that's slightly softer than mine. The dosa that I make is tasty, it's crispy, but I can't seem to replicate the dosa that's made in thousands of restaurants around India. In short, we have a situation of hard work versus skill. And when our elders mean to give us advice, they mix up the concept of skill and hard work. Hard work is just donkey work. You put in the hours endlessly, often mindlessly, trying to learn a language or practice a sport. And that donkey work may be pretty useful in some areas, but by and large, it's the hardest way to get from A to B. Skill, on the other hand, is when you execute something at high speed without resorting to hee-haw methods. Take, for instance, the act of drawing a cartoon. If you ask most people if they can draw, they seem to resort to a single stock phrase. That phrase is, I can't even draw a straight line. Supposing you did a little experiment. Supposing you were to take a random group of 500 people, you put them in the audience, and you'll find that all of them, without exception, all of them can draw a reasonably good cartoon in under five minutes. To prove this point, we started doing a bit of demonstration, both at our workshops and at other events. 
And as you'd expect, it's a random group because you're not picking the people who are coming to that event. What we do is we sit them down, give them some instructions, and we get them to draw a whale. First, they draw their version of the whale. And then we give them a set of instructions. And five minutes later, everyone's drawing a whale. But there is a difference between the first one and the second one. Five minutes later, everyone's drawing of the whale has improved dramatically. If we were to repeat that exercise once more, you would find that there is a massive leap. And it doesn't have to stop at the whale. That group could go on to draw monkeys, elephants, advarks, dinosaurs. Yeah, dinosaurs too. Wait, isn't there something wrong with this picture we are painting? Where is the hard work? How did the clients get suddenly talented? How did they go from drawing whales that look like guppies to an actual cartoon-like whale? And what if we were to treat this not as a five-minute session, but a two-day workshop on drawing animal cartoons? If we learn to draw just three or four animals per day, cartoon animals, we could leisurely cover about 24 in six hours. That's six hours, and I say six hours because six hours is the average time taken for a full day workshop. Now, let's do a little bit of repetition in that workshop. Let's do some fun exercises. And in two days, what you have is clients being able to draw about 50 animals. It's important to remember that these weren't people interested in drawing. They weren't interested in drawing animal cartoons either. Yet in two days, they have something equivalent to a business. You see the business model, don't you? 50 cartoon animals make for a great children's workshop. Many parents would be happy to send their kids, especially the younger ones, to learn how to express their creativity. Children are not your cup of chai? Well, how about adults who want to learn how to relax? A workshop would work fine for them too. And if workshops aren't your kind of thing, they're not that interesting to you, then you might make a video series. 500 people could walk out of that auditorium after two days of training, and not only would they be able to draw with confidence, but be in a pretty good position to teach. And notice something. Notice the absolute lack of hard work in the entire exercise. It's not like we don't already know that skill is superior to hard work. When you show up to a writing course, for instance, you've already done more than your share of hard work. You've tried very hard to read every possible article. You've watched videos and you've done a lot of writing, too much in fact. The results are anything but rosy. And article writing is only one of the things that we might need to have as business owners. Maybe we have to write a sales page. Just the headline of that sales page sends us into a tailspin. We're not sure. Is this the right type of headline? Will this headline work? And you'll see a headline course or a writing course and you know what you want right away. And more importantly, what you don't want. You're sick of the hard work. You know, a lot of these problems that we're having, you and I, all of them, well, many of them stem from this misplaced advice that we got as kids. And then it went through our teens and possibly even now. But hard work is the weirdest way to go through life. A simple piece of advice, a slight nudge in the right direction, and we can get to the point where we can cook, draw, write, dance. And this would be without all that fuss about do we have the right genes? But let's do a bit of a U-turn. Let's assume that hard work is the way forward. Because we have the story of Emmanuel Agassi. And if it sounds only half familiar, it's because he's the father of Agassi. Yes, Andre Agassi. The 
By the time Andre was six, his father was forcing him to hit two and a half thousand tennis balls every single day. His goal for Andre was to hit a million balls a year. So he builds this tennis court, this exclusive tennis court, just for the purpose. And he had a ball machine called the Dragon. And this Dragon, this machine, would spit out balls at the younger Agassi at 110 miles per hour. And what's the result of all this hard work? Agassi was the first male player to win all four Grand Slam tournaments on three different surfaces. He won the Australian four times, that's 1995, 2000, 2001, 2003, the French once, that's 1999, Wimbledon once, 1992, and the US Open twice, 1994, 1999. And he reached the finals 15 times. It sounds like hard work pays off, doesn't it? Yep, it does. Take the example of Michael Phelps. He was in the pool three to five hours a day, seven days a week for five whole years in a row. He didn't take a break for Christmas or even for his birthday. When we look around us, when we look at people around us, we see them making it to the top of every field. And yet, if we were to look at the guy who lost to Agassi or came second to Phelps, there's no shortage of hard work, is there? If we were to rigidly stick to the advice, work hard, you will be successful, we could, theoretically at least, spend five years non-stop in a pool and hit a million tennis balls a year and still not get the same results. Some people work as hard or even harder than you and I and they don't get anywhere in a hurry. There's a reason why hard work is so misused. Just trying to make another dosa or trying to paint yet another watercolor, that's barely enough. If you dig deep into the psyche of what makes people successful, they'll quickly or eventually all head down to the road of acquisition of skill. And that skill might take a while or it may be ready to roll in the next 48 hours. Incredible as it may sound, they'll also mention something else. And that something else? It's called luck. Which to most of us is likely to be the most frustrating part of this piece. If it's just luck, then everything is predestined, isn't it? But is luck such an overriding factor or is it just a small player? The answers are reasonably surprising, as we're about to find out. So that takes us to the second part of this episode which is hard work versus luck. When I was growing up, I read Mad Magazine a lot, but one cartoon stayed with me through all of these years, and it goes like this. A man reads about a plane crash. He sees it on TV, he hears it on the radio, and yes, he reads it on the news. And he decides, plane travel is too risky which is why he avoids the plane and he takes the train instead. And the plane? Yes, it crashes on the train. Every time I think about that cartoon, the irony of luck isn't lost on me. Every time you think about how you were born and how one tiny sperm caused you to be alive, that's a pretty good description of luck versus hard work. And it's not like we don't pay homage to luck. We talk about good luck and we talk about bad luck and we do so every single day. Yet, the moment we are asked about why we are successful, we quickly seem to credit our hard work. And that's because luck is almost impossible to fathom. Let's take a look at the story of Linda Weinman. Yes, that's the same Linda from Linda.com. And the story you read on the internet is how Lynda.com was bought over by LinkedIn, and this is for a sum of $1.5 billion. But if you roll back that story, it all boils down to one lucky moment. Here's Linda telling her story. I, you know, I went into the bookstore looking for a book for my art students and realized that they weren't written for artists, they were written for programmers. And so I pitched the idea first to Peach Pit. I was actually rejected. And um, I couldn't find a publisher to want to publish it. So I decided to write magazine article. Um, and I got I actually got a found a magazine that would let me do monthly installations and created a monthly 
uh, article. And so one month I would write about how to do animated GIFs and another month I would write about background tiles. And I was basically writing my book, but um, in magazine installations. And then by the time I was done with the book and I had a finished manuscript, then I had two different publishers that fought over me. One was Random House. The other was a division of Macmillan um, called New Writers, which ultimately got bought by Peach Pit. But um, I ended up going with New Writers and I wrote the book for my art students. So they, I turned in the manuscript and they edited it, which they always do. And they returned the edited book to me and I and it was unrecognizable. It wasn't written in the. It wasn't written the same way that I had written it. I had written it in, in a really conversational, friendly tone, lots of pictures, and they were more of a technical publisher, and they had never had a book that was written in that kind of tone. So they had taken that whole tone out of it. And so I remember when they, you know, when I read the manuscript, just being so upset at how I felt they had ruined it. I spoke to another friend of mine who had a who had a book contract and he said, well, if you don't like what they've done with it, just tell them that you consider it to be a rejection and you want your book rights back. And so I kind of mustered up all my courage and I called them that month, you know, on a Monday and just said, you know, I'm really unhappy with this edit. And they fortunately said, okay, well, if you're unhappy with it, we'll put it back to how you did it originally. And then you know, they took a really big risk on me. It was it was a very expensive book, fifty five dollars at the time, U.S. dollars. That was a lot, still a lot. And um, nobody expected it to sell out and do well, but it ended up becoming this huge best selling book for the publisher and for and for me as well, which was a big turning point in my life. There's lots of hard work and skill involved there, but you notice that there are lots of lucky moments, like. She got this magazine publisher to say, yes, okay, we'll publish your articles. And then after that, her friend says, hey, you can tell the publishers if they don't like the book as it is, then you're going to change the contract. You're going to cancel the contract. And then finally, the publishers decide to go with this unknown sort of publishing book that they've never done before. In all of this, it's luck. And take this podcast, for instance. The reason you're listening to this is a result of a story that's so freakish that it sounds like it's right out of a novel. I wasn't keen on getting to New Zealand. I wasn't even keen on marketing. I didn't even bother with marketing. Our initial goal was to move from Mumbai to Bangalore, and Bangalore was this garden city of India. It had lovely cottages. It had enormous amounts of greenery. But then our luck changed. Bangalore became a hub for technology companies, and we decided to move elsewhere. Canada, perhaps, even Australia. New Zealand wasn't even on the radar. We tried to get to New Zealand, but the immigration consultant said that we wouldn't make the points. And then one day, many months later, while shopping for groceries, I got my ticket to New Zealand. My friend Joan Chinoy ran into me and she asked, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm buying groceries. And she said, no, no, weren't you moving to New Zealand? I said, we tried to move there, but things didn't work out. You should try now, she said. And then she hands me the card of her friend who was an immigration consultant at the time. When we moved to New Zealand, the only person I knew in New Zealand lived on the North Shore. And that's where we ended up. And that's where we love it, on the North Shore. But what if someone we knew lived in a different city or a different part of Auckland? What if we got to New Zealand when the dollar was really high? Our luck was so good that the dollar was at its lowest and the housing market was pretty down. My brother-in-law even offered to give us a loan for the house from his savings, and we didn't need it after all because the bank came through. But look at all of those planets lining up one by one to give us this luck. And luck can be at times almost invisible. 
When you look at clients on the cartooning course, many of them, not all, but many, now use a tablet like the iPad. But what does the tablet do? It allows you to undo your errors. You go back just 10 years and no decent tablets existed. This meant that you either had to do battle with Photoshop or you had to have a scanner, you had to go through all of this rigmarole. In short, the amount of time and the chance for error, that just increased manifold. Plus, you had to be in a position to buy that scanner, you had to have software, and then you start to draw. Let's not forget that you had to be chained to your computer the whole time. Notice this has nothing to do with drawing at all. Someone who tried to draw just 10 years ago might have run into an endless number of frustrating points. And now that very same person could take the tablet, head to the cafe and have a great time. While learning a skill that seems clearly out of reach. Skill, not hard work, is essential. That skill might be acquired in 48 hours or 48 years, depending on what's at stake. But luck is endlessly bobbing in and out and helping us on our way. If we're really honest about ourselves, about our lives, we'll have realized that we have had enormous amount of luck, an endless run of lucky moments. And if you have any doubts about how lucky you are, think of the necessities that we take for granted. 60% of the world's population don't have access to flush toilets. They don't have adequate water-related sanitation. You and I reach for a glass of water or go to the toilet when we feel like it. We might even grumble when we don't have two toilets in the house. Now consider this scenario. Imagine every time you had to go to the toilet, you had to line up, you had to think in advance of, I have to go to the toilet, and then you had to line up. How many drawings would you do? How much code would you write? How much of your life as you know it now would exist if you had to line up, you had to do something as simple as that? Now that is hard work. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. It's more philosophical, this one. It's not a how-to, so there's no specific thing you have to do. But we'll continue this in part two. And in part two, we'll see what's needed and how you can make that luck happen for you. And not just hard work. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. Let's find out what's happening in Psychotactics land. If you had the bad luck of missing the cartooning course, well, now you have to wait for a whole year. But you still have time to join the headline course, and that starts on the 13th of July. That's not starting on the 13th of July, but the seats are available on the 13th of July. And this is a very cool course. This is one of those courses where you see skill really unfolding. You struggle so much to write headlines to begin with, so much. And then by the end of the course, you can write eight headlines, eight different types of headlines. And you can do this in 10 minutes. You can do this for any industry, not just your company, but for anyone's company. Not that you'd want to do it, but it helps to know that's how good you get. Every single one of the headlines are curious. Every single one of the headlines are amazing. And we learn not only how to make the headlines, but how to break the headlines. If you've ever wondered why the courses at Psychotactics fill up so quickly, it's because we promised this skill. And you can see how that skill is built week after week. So in effect, what you're getting are two courses. You get the headline course, but you also get an insider's view on how a course is conducted. So there you go. It's a very good course. Get on the waiting list at psychotactics.com slash not slash, slash HL. That's headlines. So psychotactics.com slash HL. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now and good luck. Bye-bye.